have to do it again when we see it. She didn't care. No. <laughs> oh my God. Ready, everybody? Happy birthday! <laughs> Hi, me. She's one of 14. She's one of 14. 
but there's only four surviving. They're all women. So if you guys want to stand up, Aunt Janet, you need to be seen. This is my Aunt Janet. Before we turn into a bunch of heathens, I'd like for my Aunt Janet to say a prayer. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. I ask God to give you every blessing. He's given you a long life. Excuse me. He's given you a long life, and you have made the best of it. Come from a very tough life to this. I am so proud of you, and I ask the Lord's blessing on you and on everyone here. And we thank the Lord for all of this food that we're about to eat. In Jesus' name. Back in. Amen. Amen. Yeah, that was terrible intro. All right, so I was told, this was, this was the setup that Tammy told me. Can we turn off the music? Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, she said, since you have nagged us to death for about five to ten years about all the details about your memorial service, <laughs> like, like right down to what she's to be buried in, <laughs> which I will be changing the, her outfit because it's terrible. Um, since you've, you know, you have all the details covered, the one thing you're not gonna know is what we say. So I'm gonna read you my eulogy. <laughs> and I have to say before I read it, you cannot tell me to change it. It's not changing. <laughs> I might add to, to it later. So anyway, so this is the eulogy that I wrote, and it's been written for a while. Okay, so. Well, the big day is finally here. <laughs> this day has been talked about and intricate, intricately planned for more than 15 years now. Wait! You're here? <laughs> that wasn't in the details. I mean, every single detail has been planned right down to the flowers and the food. And if you don't like the food, you can take that up with her later. <laughs> it seems weird being back in this church building because it will be held at the Groton Church of God on 500 Sandy Hollow Road. <laughs> This was my home church when I was a girl, the first church that I'd ever known, thanks to Mimi, as this was the church that she was saved in. I'm thankful for the godly heritage that was passed down to me and then passed down to my children. I remember being a little girl, maybe four years old, and being walked out of the Sunday night services many times as I was screaming uncontrollably because I thought something was wrong with Mimi as she was weeping and wailing at the altar. <laughs> I soon learned over the years as I grew older that nothing was wrong with Mimi. That was just how she prayed. I remember her staying with us after I was married and she was staying in Lindsay's room. She was praying in that room when the cable guy showed up. The look on his face was one of horror. <laughs> Oh, like he didn't know if he should turn around and walk back out or if he should call the cops or an ambulance. <laughs> I had to assure him that everything was okay and convince him that to stay. And then I quickly ran to Lindsay's room and let Mimi know that the cable guy was there. Mimi was a woman of prayer. If I ever needed someone to pray for me, I know I could always go to Mimi and she truly would pray for me. Many people say that they are praying for you, but really they're just thinking of you for like two seconds, but then they never really pray for you. Mimi prayed, and she probably has prayed for you as well. Mimi has always loved this church, 
and the pastors who have served here. She always took great pride in being the pastor's favorite. <laughs> Growing up, I was raised to believe that this church was the only church that was going to heaven for real. And honestly, deep down inside, I believe Grandma still thought that. <laughs> I think she might be a little surprised to see her bingo playing friends up there, as well as a few Catholics, Baptists, and Presbyterians, too. <laughs> Oh my God. So, for years when this memorial service was being discussed for the millionth time, no really, I mean not kidding, it has always been brought up that I must sing at the service. I tried to get out of it, explaining that, you know, I just might not be in the emotional place to compose myself enough to be able to sing, but that fell on deaf ears. No pun intended. <laughs> So what song should I sing? No need to guess or research the best song because that detail was covered a million times as well, although it has changed over the years. Her first request was that I sing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. <laughs> and then it changed to... What's wrong with that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it changed to We Shall Behold Him by Sandy Patty. Then it morphed into How Great Thou Art. Well... I guess I shall perform a medley. Yes. <laughs> On a serious note, my Mimi has meant the world to me. I am her firstborn grandchild and her, and I have always had a special relationship. Some highlights over the years that come to mind. Me always wanting to go home with her after the Sunday morning service. It wasn't until my mid-twenties that I realized most people did not go to church two times on a Sunday. Um, but I always begged to go home with you after the Sunday morning service. Let's see. Wait, I gotta turn the page. All right, all right, here we go. <clears throat> Another memory is me singing on the top of my lungs while standing on her coffee table, pretending it was my stage. Her neighbors complaining. <laughs> I remember her always bringing me popsicles and ginger ale when I was sick. Her buying me my first real piano. Her rescuing me from an abusive stepfather and taking me home to live with her. And then um, finding me a more permanent home with my Aunt Tammy. She was always there to listen to me. I could say anything to her and I knew her love for me would never go away. If I hurt, I knew she hurt. If I was joyed, she was joyed. I love my, how my grandmother has loved my children. To them, she was Mimi, a grandma in their life. I love how Mimi would take the time to talk to my boys. Cause you know, they're kind of harder to get to know cause they're boys. But she would take the time to know them. She would always reminisce on how she loved how Sheldon would always come in and say, hi, Mimi, and then give her a hug. She would reminisce on how when Gabriel brought her home, how he talked with her the whole ride and even helped her out of the car and was very attentive. I love how Mimi has always loved my daughter and now my granddaughter and son-in-law. Oh, how she loves my son-in-law. She kind of has a thing for tall guys. <laughs> Not just tall guys, just handsome, just handsome, handsome, handsome guys. Yeah. She likes handsome guys. Um, I will forever cherish the memories of us sitting on my front porch in the rocking chairs and just having wonderful, deep conversations. Mimi has always understood me. She knew I hated making idle chit chat and just talking about the weather. When we got together, we would talk and really talk, and that was always nice. So. I'll save the rest for later. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, Mimi. Great comments to say. So, I did a lot of thinking about what it is to live your life and and what is most important to everyone as you're going through life. And it kind of occurred to me that you know you accumulate a lot of things in life you're accumulating money you're saving you're accumulating possessions um, but you're also accumulating people and 
you know, when it when it is your time to go from this world, you can't take any of that with you, which for me means that the most important part of all of those things is the people that you surround yourself with. And I think that this gathering today is a true testament to what a successful life Mimi has had in gathering really important and lovely people in her life. People have come from all over the country to be here with you because you're so important. And we all have our own different memories and different you know, experiences that we've had with you. And one day when you're no longer here to talk to us about those things, we will have those memories inside of us for the rest of our lives. And I can't speak for everyone, but I, I think maybe I can that um, that's something that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life is all of the wonderful memories that I've shared with you. Um, so I just want to thank everyone so much for coming here from, you know, taking time out of their really busy lives and traveling long distances um, to show my Mimi. She's called something else to everyone here, but to show my Mimi how much we all love her. So thank you everyone. Hold on. Oh. Oh. All right. My mo mom was born October 25th, 1923, to the greatest generation that there ever has been. President Calvin, Calvin Coolidge was in office. Anybody remember him? <laughs> I remember the name. <laughs> yeah, I remember the name. Most homes had no electricity. My mom went through women's suffrage, the Great Depression. I want to stop here just for a minute because my mom's family was poor as crap. You know, they had 14 kids, so there wasn't much money to go around. And most of the time they'd go to school with no, no lunch. So they'd be embarrassed, her and her brother and they'd go outside during recess, I mean during lunch, and walk around the school. And sometimes the bread truck was out front, and if it was, they'd go steal a loaf of bread and have that for their lunch. But yet, she's so rich in the stories. I mean, I can remember over the years, I used to love it when my mother would get on a roll and start talking about her military, all the stuff that happened to her in the military. And she was only in for like a year and a half, but during that time, she saw and experienced a lot. And she really didn't just, she really was serving our troops. Even on her time off, she'd go in and write letters for the amputees. and and the people that, that had no sight, or whatever the case may be. And she, her life was threatened one time by, maybe he had PTSD, I don't know, but he took out a knife and said, you know, I could kill you right now, and God was with her and gave her the presence of mind to just get up and leave the room. And when she got out of there, she booked it down the hallway, and and got help and they found him outside in the bushes. So um, she's seen a lot. She's seen brain surgeries and amputee surgeries. And, and she says that her time in the military made her who she is today because she saw people that were suffering, really suffering. And she's like, I never have any room to complain. There's always somebody that has it worse off than me. And she gives that credit for seeing everything that she saw when she was in the military. All right, hold on. Oh, and also, she was stationed in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and she saw firsthand how the blacks were made to sit at the back of the bus. She saw the separate water fountains, and that was right in the height of the civil rights movement. So she was also involved in that. Um, so let's see, polio vaccine. 
the moon landing. And as of 2021, the USA has 97,914 out of 337 million Americans. So that's 0 0.027 of the population. Worldwide, there's 573,000 out of 8.1 billion. 85% of them are women, 15% of men. You know why? Because they don't listen to us. <laughs> I mean, let's do the math here, okay? I'm just saying. All right, my personal memories, just, just some of them. You know, I was telling Chelsea this morning, 65 years, I'm trying to gather 65 years of memories with my mom. It's a lot of memories. But I'm just going to talk about a few, all right? I was always told I was mom's best helper growing up from the time I could remember. When mom was sick and couldn't get up in the morning, I'd always make her a cup of coffee, bring it to her. <clears throat> I'd haul firewood when we were without electricity. <laughs> or, haul, or haul water when our water pipe froze from the brook. And back then, when the ground was frozen, it was frozen all winter. So we went one whole winter with no running water. I got, you know our backyard, right? I'd have to go down that hill. And haul the water up from the brook. But you know what? Even when we were without power, you know, you'd make a fire in the fireplace and you'd bring out your mattress and you'd kind of make it fun for me and Lisa, you know. And, and it, we knew it was hard times, but you made it as easy as you could. So thank you for that. <clears throat> So I remember in the summers, mom's best trick for getting the house clean was, do you want to go to the beach today? <laughs> All right, but the house needs to be clean before we leave. <laughs> so we just be <laughs> going to town. And then we'd head out to the squam kit. And I remember one time, and I don't know why, but it's my earliest memory of going to the beach with my mom. She, we got there, everything was fine, and she decided she was going to go in the water. And she went in the water, and she was body surfing. I thought she was drowning. I was standing on the shore screaming my lungs off because I was so afraid she was going to drown. And she kept trying to reassure me that she was fine. She was just having fun. But in my mind, she was going to drown, and she needed to get out of that water. Uh, I remember, as an adult, when you lived in Ledger, going to over to your house every night to watch the Red Sox play or playoff, only to lose because Bill Buckner let the ball go through his legs. Unbelievable! I mean, every night, every night I was over there, they were doing so good. And, yeah, whatever. I remember one time, I don't know how old I was, maybe, I don't know, seven or eight years old. We had one of those little plastic pools. And we always had to keep in a different spot of the yard because my dad didn't want the grass to die, right? So this time the pool was way down in the backyard. So I come up to my mom and I say, Mom, can you come fill the pool with water? I want to go swimming. She's like, okay, go down by the pool. I'll be there in a minute. I'm like, okay. So I go down there. And I'm sitting there, and she wasn't coming, so I decided to get in the pool and just lay down for a while, right, and wait for it. So little did I know that my mother had forgotten about coming out to fill the pool because I was sleeping. <laughs> so so when she finally remembered, and I wasn't around, she came so close to calling the police because she thought that something had happened to me. When right at the last minute, after she had called and searched, and she something said, "Go, go down, and check in the pool, check by the pool." So she walked down, and sure enough, I was in the pool sleeping, waiting for her to come fill it. <laughs> and then another time when I was in the Air Force, <clears throat> I told, I called her. Back then, we didn't have internet, we didn't have text, right? It cost money to call long distance. 
So I called her and I said, a bunch of friends and I are going to go out in the woods and we're going to camp for the weekend. So she's like, okay. So we did. You know, my friends and I went out to camp for the weekend. I came home and went back to my job in the military. And next thing I know, I get a knock on my door. It was about maybe a week, week later. I get a knock on my door. It's the local police. So I'm like, okay. I'm like, yeah. Are you Tammy Mason? Yes. Would you call your mother? She thinks that you're out in the woods and somebody has murdered you. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I will. I will call her. <laughs> so, um, do I have anything else? I don't know, but I could go on and on with the memories of you. Us, when I was a little girl, laying in bed, naming laundry soap commercials. I don't, I don't even know what that was about, but we went back and forth just seeing who could name the last commercial. I don't know. So, I love you, Mom. What about the time you said this to you? Alright, <laughs> 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 right, so back in the day, we were... Back, back, okay. So, back, well, it was my job to take the trash out, number one. Back in the day, I had all the boys' jobs. Mowing the grass, hauling wood, you know, stuff like that. All right, so. I digress. Um, <laughs> so, back in those days, we were allowed to burn our own garbage. And we had, like, one of those barrels, you know. So, I went out there, and I'm doing my thing, and I lit lit the garbage on fire. Well, it happened to be a windy day, and some of the ash went over into the field and caught the field on fire. I was so petrified that I was going to be taken to jail <laughs> that I ran in the house, and I ran behind the door of my parents' bedroom, and I would not come out. The fire marshal came to the door. I heard him talking to my mother. And I just knew I was going to jail for setting that not for the fire. living in Tennessee, um, staying with a girlfriend of mine, and I had no transportation to, to, I got a job, but I had no transportation to get there. So she's like, I've got a motorcycle. If you want to use it, you know, you're more than welcome to use it. So I'm like, well, I don't know how to ride, you know, drive. I've never driven one. I'll teach it. I'm like, okay. So she had this huge front, front yard, and she gets her motorcycle out, and she's telling me everything and how to do it and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, I get on it, and I'm going, and I'm doing my thing, and then I turn, and I'm heading towards the street, and I panicked. I froze. <clears throat> Don't know why, but I did. I froze, and I ran into this big drainage ditch and broke my arm, but I told my mom I broke my arm because I knew if she knew I was on a motorcycle, she would kill me, so I told her I broke my arm playing basketball, only to find out from another friend of mine, mother who lived in Ohio, <laughs> just happened to call my mom one day. They were talking, and she's like, yeah, it's really too bad Tammy broke her arm riding that motorcycle. And so she, I got ratted out on that one. Yeah, I never got by with too many lies. <laughs> How did you say that? Yeah, that is true. Ask my daughters. <laughs> All right. Happy birthday, Mom. <laughs>